Good afternoon, everyone. If you can get to your seats. If everyone could come to your seats, we're so pleased to have such a great crowd tonight for such a uh, great event. And I'm going to step right out there and say that I know that's going to be. So particularly all the school board members have name uh, tents and all the transition team. So thank you very much for coming and we're just really pleased tonight to have uh, our panel from Charlotte Mecklenburg and all of you on the transition team. We've been talking about this for quite a while. We've been thinking about it. We're so glad that we have so many of the Shelby County School Board members here and hopefully some more will uh, step in also because these learning experiences are uh, for you also. We've been able to pull some together, but we're uh, so very glad that all of you are here. I want to also thank uh, tonight, before we start, the Hyde Family Foundation uh, for making this evening possible. I don't know what we would do without our philanthropic community, uh, but when we started this, the Hyde Family Foundation, and, and there's so many others that uh, have helped and are helping, uh, but they said to us, what do you need? And we talked to them about some learning opportunities that would be helpful. Uh, and so, uh, as true to form, they have stepped up and made this evening uh, possible for us. So we're very happy about that. And I'm going to introduce a person from the Hyde Family Foundation in just a moment. Before I do, I want to recognize some other people in the audience. Uh, are our superintendents in the audience yet? I know that they are coming. So when they sneak in, I won't embarrass them, but we all know, are happy to have them. We've also got uh, individuals on the front table uh, here. We have uh, from the Hyde Family Foundation, Pitt Hyde, uh, who's the, um, I guess you're the president of the Hyde Senior. Okay, well, you know, that's what I say. He's Barbara's husband, so we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, Teresa Sloyan, who's the executive director of the Hyde Family Foundation. Terrence Patterson, who handles all of the things that have to do with education, has been very instrumental in helping to pull together the panel. We also have Josh Edelman with us tonight from the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're very happy to have Josh is here. He feels like a Memphian because he's here uh, every week and he's very uh, faithful to come uh, to these meetings. Uh, we also have with us tonight uh, four of the team members uh, from the Boston Consulting Group. I know all of you have heard uh, about that and read about it in the paper, so I'd like for you to raise your hands. We've got, uh, there they are, the four right there. Lane McBride is our project manager and he has a team with him. And it is Jamie, and I said I was going to say the last names, but I may not do that, Delano, <laughs> Delano and Nithia. Uh, they're here with us tonight. Um, anyone else that I am missing? Okay. All right, then let's move on because we do have a full evening. I want to first uh, thank all of you on the panel for coming. All of, uh, all of the, our panel members will be introduced in just a moment. But I'd like to introduce Barbara Hyde, uh, who is the uh, president of the Hyde, uh, J.R. Hyde the Third Foundation. Uh, and she sits on, is the, uh, a director on the J.R. Hyde Senior Foundation, which together make up the Hyde Family Foundations. Uh, I've known Barbara almost since she's been in Memphis. Uh, and she's always had a great interest in education. In fact, she was someone that I went to uh, in, in my very rudimentary way, because I had just started this, to ask if she would contribute to my school board campaign. <laughs> and she did. And so uh, I served on the school board for, for three years. Uh, since then, Barbara uh, has, in, along with the foundation, over the past uh, 10 or so years, have really... Uh, done so much in the area of education in this community. Uh, and Barbara has, um, has been instrumental in bringing much of the uh, reform that has come into the community along with many other, uh, many other individuals too. She's also uh, now the chair of the Shelby Farms um, Conservator 
And so she is uh, involved in also assets in other ways uh, that, that help our county. Uh, she was a founding chairman of the Women's Foundation. Uh, so Barbara, we're just very pleased to have you tonight with us and thank you along with uh, Pitt and Teresa and Terrence for making this evening uh, possible. Well, thank you. Oh, please. Uh, um, uh, Barbara, that was a very kind um, introduction. And I want to start by saying how very deeply grateful Pitt and I are to all of you in this room, every one of you, particularly those of you at this center table and in the surrounding uh, seats who are so dedicated to doing this very meaningful and, and difficult and challenging uh, but at the end of the day, absolutely central work of bringing these two very good systems together to create together a great system that's going to benefit the students in our county. I know, just because I know a little bit about your schedule just this week, I know how much time this is taking on all of your parts. So I just, on behalf of Pitt and our family and our foundation, just want to thank you for your leadership, your time, and your dedication. Um, we're going to have a great time today hearing from some people who've been through the wars, the battles, the continuing uh, uh, struggles, and have come through a consolidation in a way that uh, has served the, the children of Charlotte Mecklenburg and done what we aspire to do, and that is to create a, a system that's stronger and is a, a benchmark uh, goal-setting system for us. Um, Charlotte, we think, is important. We spent some time uh, about a month or so ago looking at, looking at the Chattanooga merger. I think we learned a lot about that. Charlotte is important for a number of reasons. Um, it's important to understand the parallels we have with Charlotte in scale, in size, close to similar demographics, um, and so we think that there's a lot we can learn there. Um, it's also important to, to recognize that Charlotte is now known as a district. While they're quick to remind us that they're not there yet, they have ways to go, more battles to fight, um, but it's a district that is now being widely recognized through the Broad Prize and in other ways as a district that is making huge strides to close the achievement gap. So today our guiding question is going to be, what are the essential core ingredients necessary for a world-class education system. What can we learn from the lessons um, of Charlotte Mecklenburg? Uh, where are there parallels we can benefit? Where are there differences that we need to understand to meaningfully move ahead? Um, I'm going to just quickly introduce our panelists. Let me, let me just tell you what, how we hope to structure this. We're going to take the first maybe 30, 45 minutes to let our panelists kind of frame their story for us, uh, give us an overview of where they've been and where, they've, where they are now. Um, and then we hope to move very quickly into some questions and answers for you all. Um, really, I think the most meaningful part of this will be the, the, the dialogue between all of you at these tables and our guests. So um, first, starting from this end of the table is, is Arthur Griffin. Arthur will introduce himself in greater detail, but he's a vice president of Urban Advisory Services, a division of McGraw-Hill, and has been a part of the success of Charlotte Mecklenburg's merger for many years. Uh, 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 Bill Anderson is next, is the executive director of what's called MECED, which is the Mecklenburg Citizens for Public Education, also been through many, many years and lots of lessons learned in Charlotte. Uh, Eric Davis, um, the chair of the Memphis Board of Education. Excuse me. <laughs> That's a promotion. That's a, uh, the Charlotte Board, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board. And then Pete Gorman, who is currently the Senior Vice President for Education Services at News Corporation, um, and, but, but more relevant to today, from 2006 to 2011, was the superintendent of Charlotte Mecklenburg and uh, is widely credited for providing the leadership that took Charlotte Meck to the point where they were awarded the Broad Prize. So I'm going to pass the microphone on to Pete, and we'll get going. Is it here or up there? Wherever you want. Okay. Then we'll go with that. 
can the people in the back see us, or it would be better if we stood up? Uh, stand, all right. Well, thank you all very much for inviting us to be here with you today. I am Pete Gorman, the former superintendent of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, and I'm going through a challenge right now. And that is when you are former anything, sometimes you look back and you only remember all the positive moments when you were in a job. And let me tell you, it was very hard being the superintendent of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, but we had a great team that we got to work with. But it was difficult, back-breaking work. And it's work that I am definitely glad that I did. And I got to work with the most wonderful team of individuals, and some of the individuals who are with you today are part of that team over many, many years. And I got sort of brought into the district, airlifted in, in 2006, though. So my moment in time in Charlotte starts at that moment. That's why I think it's important that we start off by letting some of these individuals just briefly tell you their history with Charlotte just in a minute or so so you can understand the context and the flavor of how long they've been living what has gone on in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. Arthur, if we could start with you, please. Since they said that uh, they couldn't see us in the back, I guess I'll stand. Uh, my name is Arthur Griffin, and first of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting us to share uh, our little piece of history with you. Uh, I started off uh, getting involved with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools in 1975. I was only in third grade at the time, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, I was involved from an advocacy perspective as a community advocate, and I said I'd never be on the school board. I thought politicians were crazy, and ended up getting elected to the school board in about 1985, and from 1985 I served on the school board uh, with one small departure for 17 years, uh, and for five of those 17 years, the five that I remember being in federal court all the time, from 1997 to 2002, uh, I chaired the Board of Education in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we have a, a wonderful story to tell with respect to Charlotte Mecklenburg. Uh, I'll just say one thing uh, that really uh, stood out in our tenure, and that is we wanted every high school to be an IB high school or an AP high school. And when we started AP, we put that in countywide, and one of the results of that is for every African-American student that took the AP exam, 33% of them came out of Charlotte, when we had just about 10% of the student population. But for every African-American student that made a, a uh, three or better, 24% came out of, out of Charlotte. So uh, it was a great experience for me. Uh, I loved the work. Uh, I loved the, the advocacy. The entire time on the school board, uh, with the exception of the last several years, I served in an at-large position because it was a countywide election when I served on the Board of Education. And my last few years, we went to a quasi three-member at-large, six-member districts. That's enough babbling right now. Uh, I'll be more than happy to kind of respond during the Q&A because my leader over here said uh, just a minute or two. So thank you for inviting me. As he's passing the microphone, Arthur, graduate of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools? Born in Charlotte, North Carolina, went through all the discussions about consolidation. We had two consolidations. Uh, one, when the city school system merged with the county school system. That discussion occurred in the late 50s, finalized in 1960. What I call a functional, another consolidation, is when we decided to recognize that there were African-American students in, in Mecklenburg County. That occurred after a lawsuit in the late 60s, about 1969. So. I have a little bit of experience in Charlotte and Mecklenburg, both as a, a student and being a part of a family who was a part of that fight, and also having the pleasure of being in a governance and a policy-making role. Bill? I'm Bill Anderson, and I'm the executive director for MECED, as you heard about me, but there's a lot more about me that uh, I have to share with you that might be more interesting to this audience. I began my teaching career in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools back in 1976. I was a teacher for 11 years, then I became an assistant principal for four, then I was a principal for 13 years, and I ended my career as an assistant superintendent for instruction. So I watched what happened through CMS for many, many years. Uh, I did leave the district for five years and went to a neighboring community, and the neighboring community were the Cleveland County Schools, but I happened to work for the Shelby City Schools. 
I was principal of Shelby High School. And right at the end of my five years at Shelby, uh, we went through a merger, went through a consolidation. So I can tell you that I saw it from the beginning to the end, the good, the bad, the ugly, the fear that people had. But at the end of the day, the Cleveland County Schools are a very uh, good, strong school district. Uh, but I had the pleasure of working with Pete in a nonprofit role. Uh, I, I resigned, retired uh, six years ago and uh, had a 30-minute exit interview planned with Pete, and that ended up being an hour and 45, and we kind of hit it off. But what we have at the panel here is we have folks that have very different views and different time perspectives of what happened in Charlotte, and the Charlotte story is a good story, but to steal from Pete a moment ago, it's hard work, it's ongoing, and there's much work to do. Good evening. Uh, my name's Eric Davis. Um, like Arthur, I'm a Charlotte native, and my involvement in the school system began in 1967 as a first grader. And the first couple of years, I attended segregated schools in Charlotte, an all-white school. And then in the third grade, along with my two older brothers, we participated in students, as students, in the desegregation of uh, Charlotte schools. And each one of us changed schools. We went to different ones that weren't in our neighborhood. So my earliest experiences was that whole period of transition that has defined Charlotte for the last 40 years. And then after uh, serving in the Army for a while and private industry, I had a chance to move back to Charlotte, which is where my wife and I always wanted to raise our children. And so today I, I'm a CMS parent. I have a daughter in the eighth grade. I have a daughter who actually graduates this year and who attended CMS for part of her her uh, education, but because of some special needs, uh, attended uh, schools outside the system. So we've experienced the highs and lows of CMS. And then a couple years ago, I had an opportunity to run for the Board of Education. Today, I'm uh, District 5 representative and chair of the board. Thank you, Eric. So we've got a good panel here with you today. Share a little bit about what is going on and start off by saying context matters. The work we're going to talk about today is built on the framework and the excellence that was put forward by folks over many, many years. The success Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools was recognized for this year, winning the Broad Prize for Urban Education, would have never happened if the work that Arthur and Eric Smith and the team that was there in the 90s and the early part of the 2000s didn't do the work that they did. So it was a building process through all of that. As Arthur mentioned, we went through essentially several different points of that. There was the Swan versus Mecklenburg case that came after the consolidation of the school district, which brought in court-ordered busing for desegregative purposes. And then there was in 2001, 2002, which was kind of the end of the period where that occurred when the school district was declared to be in unitary status. So we've gone through a variety of changes over the years. Just a few of the successes of the district in recent years, just to share, and we'll move off from there then. The district was recognized for the Broad Prize for Urban Education. To give an example, some of that growth in each area, every grade level assessment, AP, SAT, every area, the district has made dramatic improvement in each area over the last several years. As a matter of fact, two years ago, 97% of the schools averaged at least a year's growth in a year's time for students, up from 54% six years earlier. The reading, the achievement gap in reading and mathematics for economically disadvantaged students, African American students and Hispanic students, more than a third of that gap has been cut. It is still horrifically large. It is still 20 points, but it's gone from over 33 points to 20 points. Dramatic improvement has been made in that area. Algebra 1 in English 1, over half the achievement gap has been removed. Anyone here who works in a high school will tell you the two gatekeepers to high school graduation, Algebra 1 and English 1. People don't drop out of high school who finished Algebra 1 and English 1. They drop out of high school if they can't get through those areas. Looking at the SAT scores, we've gone from trailing the state by 16 points to leading the state by 12 points. And of the 75 largest districts in America, a greater percentage of African American students take the SAT than in any large district in America in Charlotte-Mecklenburg schools. 
AP pass rate has gone up nine points while increasing the number of students taking advanced placement tests. And in NAEP, we're in the top three nationally in each category for large districts. But progress has been painfully slow. And at the rate we are moving in Charlotte, it will still be 15 years until those achievement gaps are completely closed. Think about that. We're talking about children who are not even yet in preschool if we continue on that pace and we are the national leader. Now, with that in mind, there are constants and there are variables in Charlotte. There are variables like time, people, money, access to things, but there's one constant and that is every parent and every community member thinks that every child should get a quality education and we need to deliver that. Now to do that, we've had to come up with a plan in Charlotte to do that. And it started off with the Board of Education many years ago, Arthur was a key push for this, determining that every child needs a great education regardless of where they live or what zip code they are in. Over time, how to approach that has changed. I absolutely believe that the procedures, policies, and rules put in place from the early 90s and mid 90s were exactly what we needed at that time to put us in the position we are today, but we need to continue to modify and become more aggressive. And in doing that, the board passed a theory of action or what they believe in. And in doing that, we aligned all of our actions to do that. And what the board decided was we were going to move to a climate of effectiveness. And I will tell you, that's difficult in education because we like to talk about things highly qualified. That's big in education. Frankly, I don't care if Dr. So-and-so teaches my daughter. I care about if an effective teacher teaches my daughter. I care about if an effective school system delivers what needs to be delivered to my daughter. And the route to accomplish that and do that doesn't have to be just one path to get there. So we've made the decision in the school district that we are going to have what we call freedom and flexibility with accountability. The better the results you deliver, the more freedom you get to take different paths to get there. And in doing that, we found some interesting things. We found some people that we thought that were doing really good work, and they weren't. The kids were coming in up here, and they were leaving here. But they were still so far above the bar, we thought they were superstars. And we had some other schools where we had people who were coming in here, and were leaving here, and the work to move from there to there is heroic, and phenomenal, and if you look at that, you say to yourself, my gosh, that was harder than any other school in our district. So we worked on developing a plan or coming up with principles that we felt would lead us to be where we needed to be. And it had five main areas. We developed a plan that focused on great leaders, great teachers, data and accountability systems, differentiating resources, and engaging parents and community members. And everything we did, we aligned to those areas. Just talk briefly about each one, then we'll move into the next section. Effective leaders, great leaders, in my mind, it was the most important thing we worked on. Because what I found was, great teachers don't go work for lousy principals. <laughs> and poor, for, poor performing teachers accumulate under poor performing principals. So that's why we decided we were going to grow our own because we thought self-selection to enter into graduate school to create a pool of candidates to be great principals is really a poor methodology. So we decided that from the moment someone entered the teaching profession, we started watching them to see if they had potential to be a great leader. 
and we started tapping them and giving them opportunities to grow into leadership roles. As a matter of fact, we have a program for between the first and second year of being within Teach for America that you can come and intern in the district office with our executive staff so we can try to find a way to keep you in education, stay long term, and even if you leave the field that instead of going to be a lawyer practicing some type of law different than education, you'll stay in school law. So we put you with our school board attorney. But you've got to tackle the leadership issue first and foremost, and along with that, you've got to tell the truth to adults. Because if you don't tell the truth to adults, you could be lying to kids. And what we found was, if you don't, from the leadership positions, start tackling the effectiveness issue and removing the folks who aren't effective, you sure as heck can't have any credibility when you stand there with your principals and tell them to do the same thing. So we tackled that issue of effectiveness with our leaders. And it brought some real struggles and some real challenges. Right now I can tell you that I've left the superintendency there, and four other individuals have left the school district to run large urban school districts from the five years from the team we put together. They're running Sacramento, Greensboro, Fulton County, and a district called Norwalk La Mirada of 40,000 kids in California. Because you've got to have a great team to do this. You've got to have the superintendent for that moment in time where repertoire and matching come into place. That the repertoire of skills of the superintendent matches that environment you're asking them to take on. And that they bring the team that can do that as well. Second area, great teachers, great educators. We're talking about a human capital system. And some people really chafe at that. These are teachers. This is not a human capital system. They are. They are great teachers. But you've got to have a system to make sure you have the right folks. And that system includes how you identify, recruit, hire, place, support, professionally develop, evaluate, compensate, and reward, promote, and retain or dismiss. And you've got to do every single piece of that. And if you miss on one of those pieces, you're going to lose great teachers. Because it's a business. And it's a hard business. But HR has to be one of your key areas of focus. And the first moment budget cuts come, you can't cut HR because you are essentially killing the pipeline of great staff coming in. And with that piece with great teachers, we're talking about highly effective people. I, I was at a meeting one time with Larry Summers, and he said, if you offer me A-plus people and B-plus strategy, or A-plus strategy or B-plus people, I'll take A-plus people every time. Because B-plus strategy doesn't last with A-plus people. And that's what we're talking about. Great teachers and great leaders. But with the great teachers, you got to hit both sides of it. And the story I tell folks is on my daughter's first day of school in Charlotte Mecklenburg. She was on the playground. She was running across the playground to see me because I was coming to visit her school day. And she fell down on the playground. She scraped her knee. Her teacher was between her and me, and her teacher went and hugged her. That was the most effective teacher in America. My daughter's now in the eighth grade taking algebra. She's doing incredibly well. She was not on that path when she entered middle school. But because of her sixth grade and seventh grade math teachers, she's now taking high school math. Those are the most effective teachers in America that can do that. So how do we measure that effectiveness, and how do we tell the truth to folks? And telling the truth to folks goes as far as this. If you walk in two classrooms, one's doing great work and one's doing pretty good work, if you give them both the same feedback, you've not told them the truth. It's especially that way if one's doing great work and one's doing poor work. They walk out of their classrooms together when the bell rings for lunch. They go down the hall, hey, I saw you got observed today. So did I. How'd it go? He said, I'm doing great. That person thinks to themselves, I know you're not doing great. I'm in the room next to you. It's damn anarchy in there. He told me I'm doing great. Does that person even know great when they see it? Do they understand it? So you've got to tackle those issues related to human capital. And in doing that, you've got to tackle issues like this. There's a policy in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools that says the superintendent will develop regulations and strategies designed to measure and ensure all schools have a reasonable balance of teachers, new and experienced, a complement of teachers with advanced degrees and certifications, and national board certified teachers. I'll be honest, that never really meant much to me. 
But then it goes on to say, and a significant number of teachers with a history of moving their students to higher level of achievement. You've got to tackle that. And we did that in Charlotte. How do we do that? Well, when you start moving great principals to the schools with those greatest challenges, great teachers follow them. But you've got to create an environment for them to go to those schools. And we'll talk a little bit more about that during Q&A. But in doing that as well, you can't push them in there. You've got to pull them in there. That's my belief. Now, others on the panel may differ from me on that, and I understand that. But I don't believe you can force someone to work at a particular school. You've got to create conditions where they want to be there. And it can be done. So human capital, great teachers. Third area, accountability and data. You've got to be able to create an environment where you have an accountability system that provides support, transparency, and pressure. And in doing that, we say that we share data regarding the three C's, clarity, context, and candor. This is where we are. This is how we compare to others. And is it good enough or isn't it good enough? And that's how we've approached the Broad Prize. We are very proud of that in Charlotte. But we've got a lot more work to do. A lot more work to do. With that as well, I believe that in an accountability system, you've got things like input regulation, outcome-based accountability, and market-based controls. What are some basic standards every school has to have? How do you judge people based on how effective they are? Then the final area, do people want to go to school there? And they're all important, and we can talk to you more about how we did that. Then the final area is differentiated support or resources. And when I'm talking about resources, I'm going to give you the list ordinal. It is people, time, and money. People, time, and money. My daughter attends the middle school that last year we spent the least amount of money per pupil at her school because we actually calculated out per pupil in real dollars spent per school. And I am perfectly comfortable with that. Because she's getting the excellence in instruction that she needs. But we've got other children who need access to a higher level of effectiveness than they get right now in a greater dosage and more supports around them. So in Charlotte-Mecklenburg schools, the elementary schools vary from getting $4,000 per pupil to almost $11,000 per pupil. Because different kids need access to different things. And in doing that, that weighted student staffing formula, that is something that goes all the way back to the time it went in a different format when Arthur was there. But some kids need different resources. And if you're going to offer an AP course at some school because there's 25 kids, you can't deny a child at another school from that because there's not enough kids that want access to that, which means it's going to cost you some more money to do some things. And then the fifth area, parent and community engagement and involve with, involvement. I thought we were doing a really good job with that until last year when we closed schools. You, just, you, you can't close schools well. You can't. People came out, people angry, but you can't do it well. And you know what? It's probably good that I'm not superintendent in Charlotte anymore because I'm the guy that closed schools. So I take that baggage with me, and we're working now on rebuilding that trust in the community because we got a lot of people in the community that would tell you, I can't believe they're the best large district in America. They're the people that took my school. So it's hard. But we've done things like Parent University that has tens of thousands of parents every year participate, outreach in manners like that, that has really been a strong piece. So I think you have a unique opportunity. You have the ability to vision a school district and build it to be what you want it to be. You have the ability to build it on the pillars or frameworks of what you think the effectiveness needs to be. I will tell you, for us again, great leaders, great teachers, data and accountability systems, differentiating resources and parent and community engagement. And it's going to be hard work, but it's the best work you'll ever do. Barbara? All right, well, Pete has, um, Pete has described 
the context that mattered so much in, in Charlotte. And I think you can tell from his clarity and the, and the obvious passion um, what made him such a, such a strong leader. Um, I want to just kick off a, one or two quick questions and then we'll quickly pass, pass the microphone out uh, to the audience here. Um, as a winner of the Broad Prize, um, I'd like to ask each of you to uh, kind of reflecting on what's Pete, what Pete has described as the, the context and key strategies. Uh, what do you think? Um, what do you think really is working well in Charlotte now as a result of consolidation, and what's not working well? Let's go quickly to to biggest strength, biggest weakness in each, and I'll just uh, start with Eric. Well, uh, first of all, I hope you learn from our mistakes and you move a lot faster than, than we've moved. Um, I think our, whatever our success we've had um, has had three or four key milestones. The first was what Arthur described back in the late 50s and 60s. We came together as one county. And we came together for financial reasons, frankly. Then the second milestone is when we desegregated the system and we frankly confronted the issues between the systems that had earlier existed. And then the third milestone was what I really attribute Arthur's leadership to, was pushing for the same resources and the same opportunities for every student. And then the last milestone is what happened just before Pete was hired. The board at that time, long before I was ever on it, made this fundamental shift that Pete described, a shift from not just providing an opportunity for an education, not just providing access, but to actually teaching and learning. Not asking ourselves, does every child get the same lesson every day in every school, which is what we were focused on at that time, but how well are our students learning? It's a shift from compliance to performance. And what we've spent the last five years, and the reason we hired this guy, was he understood what performance meant and could, our, could put it into operational strategies that I'm sure we'll describe later this evening. But what surprised me was how the issue of performance doesn't resonate with so many folks. I mean, for most of us as parents, we would say, I want a lot of things for my kid. But the main thing I want is a good education. But when you really start pushing on what it's going to take to raise the performance of a system, you find a lot of resistance. And I think it's because we have different definitions of success in Charlotte, of what the school system needs to do for us. And so despite all that, I think what enabled us to, to do things well were those things that the school system could unilaterally control on its own. Hiring a good superintendent, selecting principals based on their merit, assigning them to schools where we need them, training teachers. All of those things that the school system could do on its own, I think we did a really good job. What could we do better? Those parts of engaging the community, of building teamwork with the county government and the city government and developing this unity of purpose and common goal that what we're about is a better Charlotte Mecklenburg and everybody's got a piece to contribute and we're all going to be willing to change to get there. That's the part I'd like to see us do better. Thanks, Eric. Um, when I think about what we did well and what we're still doing well is we have a laser-like focus on the numbers. We pay great attention to student achievement. That student achievement is not just some fuzzy goal that we want to achieve, but we really look at students where they are at the beginning of the year and where they are at the end of the year. Pete mentioned in his words earlier that um, Sometimes kids come in the fifth grade and they're already reading on a seventh grade level. Well, they should be reading on an eighth grade level. They should get at least one year of growth per year. So what we did in our district is we paid very close attention to all students. We had some very honest conversations about the achievement gap. We knew the gap 
between white students and black students was way too wide. And over the past few years, we've, sh we've shown growth for white students, black students. The achieve achievement gap has become smaller, but it's still there. But we talked about these things. And our teachers, it became part of their language. Uh, another thing that we did very well is the concept of strategic staffing, where Pete would choose some of his best principals in the district and ask them to go work in one of our most challenged schools. I used to be a principal of a very high performing school. And I can tell you that my job was much easier than some of my colleagues who were across town in schools that had very high percentages of kids who were in poverty. My job was easier because I could recruit. I would have kids from Notre Dame that would be sending me their resumes wanting to come and work in my school. Kids, young kids that are going to become teachers are savvy. And they pay very close attention to the numbers. And they want to work in high performing schools. So strategic staffing worked. But it takes, it takes some guts because you're asking your best principals to leave their comfort zone and go work in some of the most challenged schools. Now, Pete was smart enough that he didn't send them there by themselves. He sent them with five or six other teachers, an assistant principal, and then they could move five or six teachers. So what you tried to do is you tried to change the culture in that school. That worked. The third thing we did that was really good and we still continue to do is around weighted student staffing. Those schools that have the higher percentages of students that live in poverty get more money. And when you look at our district on an interactive map and you look at one elementary school in the inner city is getting about $10,000 per student and then another school that's way in the suburbs that's a more affluent neighborhood and they're only getting 5,000 students per child, that might rub some folks the wrong way. But our community is willing to have those very difficult and open decisions that the playing field is not level and that some schools and some students deserve more. Um, when we talk about what's not working well, to me the thing that's not working well is we as a community, and I think as a society and a country in general, have not yet accepted the fact that every kid is our kid. We still tend to think that there's some kids that live over there, they're not our kids, that's those other kids. We still have this, oh, I want to take care of my backyard and my school, not care. And until we get past that and we realize that they're all our kids, and let me tell you, it's good, economic, uh, good economics to think that way. Um, that is something that's a little bit disconcerting to me. And the other thing that Eric touched on is communication. You've got to communicate. You have to stop and talk to the community. I said as we walked in here, it was so great. Arthur and I were talking about this at lunch today, about how it's easy to inform and educate people, but it's hard to engage. And you have a community that's engaged tonight. You've got a full house. This is something, obviously, that your community is very interested in. So keep communicating to them. Keep talking. I don't know what I can say now. I mean, I just ditto, ditto, and ditto. <laughs> now I can sit down. But uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be even associated. But to tell you, we come from different uh, arenas. When uh, these guys won the Broad Prize, uh, I was in D.C. in the audience, uh, but I work at McGraw-Hill, another company in New York. But I was there to cheer these folk on. But uh, after the end of the ceremony, uh, they asked me to come up and take a picture with them uh, because it's really, I think, symptomatic of, of, of the fact that we're still a team. Although I've been out of the, the public sphere for about eight years, it's still my home, hometown school district. I care deeply about what goes on in Charlotte Mecklenburg. And whenever I can help in any way, I'm certainly there. Um, let me just go back and say a couple of things because they've covered almost everything. Um, Charlotte uh, consolidated in 1960 officially, but prior to that, uh, in the late 50s, there was a big discussion about why to consolidate. And I think this is important. Um, the discussion at the time was we needed to help those poor kids out in the county. Uh, in, in Mecklenburg County, all of the, the wealth and the, the things that were happening were considered to be happening in the city school system. Uh, the taxes were higher in Charlotte. Uh, teachers were paid a higher salary in Charlotte. But those rural people out there, and then come along uh, Duke Power to dam up a couple of lakes, and the farmers all moved to the city. But the, the, the strategy and reason for, for consolidating 
was the fact that we wanted every child in Mecklenburg County to have a great education. And it's that kind of spirit that occurred in the 50s and 60s that carries through today. Now, we, there are some problems uh, that occurred uh, when they merged. They were talking about white kids. I uh, didn't think about black kids until the lawsuit came along uh, in the 60s. But despite the fact that there were lawsuits, that same can-do attitude was back in play, even through desegregation and all of the tensions that come with that. And I went through all of that, and in getting on the school board and being on the school board for 17 years, uh, worked with five different superintendents uh, during that period of time. The tail end of one superintendent who had been there for about eight years, I came in on the tail end of that tenure. But every superintendent would come in, uh, they would always declare how awful the, the kids are doing, and then by the time they would leave, the next one would come in, how awful the kids are doing. But during that tenure, people say, oh, how great the kids are doing. Each year, the scores are going up. And by the time I um, got in a leadership position on the school board, uh, it was Eric Smith's time to become the superintendent. Poor Eric Smith, coming from uh, Newport School System up in uh, Virginia, Newport News. Um, a couple of us got together and said, whoever we hire as the next superintendent has to agree to get put measurable objectives in their contract. And we were the first urban school district in America to put urban, urban objectives and metrics in a large city superintendent's contract. And that was because of data, the data systems we had learned to create. And although they were not nearly as sophisticated as what Peter has put together, uh, but there were data systems because we wanted to hold superintendents accountable. And back in the old days, I'm talking about, this was 96, so back in the old days, we said we wanted to raise the floor and the ceiling at the same time. Those kids who were doing well, who were already proficient, we set metrics and benchmarks to take them to a higher level. That's where AP came involved, and as we were successful mastering North Carolina standards, I don't know too much about Tennessee standards, I said we need to figure out how to make sure our kids are competitive worldwide. And in working with the Council of Great City Schools, we were able to get federal legislation changed so that NAEP, the nation's report card, could be used to evaluate and assess on a pilot basis a couple large urban school districts. And once we got that legislation approved, there were five districts at first, I think they're now 17 or 21, but Charlotte was one of those early districts because we wanted our kids to be measured from the top, not the bottom. And that's all kids. And my whole tenure at Charlotte Mecklenburg, uh, I was an at-large representative. So I had to go to all the small towns, uh, to the public housing neighborhoods, and uh, sitting down with Hugh McCall at Bank of America, and try to engage the public in the public schools. And as a result of that, we were able to get the kind of support to do some pretty phenomenal things, I think, early on. Uh, we were the first public school system to introduce something called a balanced scorecard because we wanted to manage our resources appropriately so that we could maximize the opportunities and access for learning experiences for all kids in Mecklenburg County. When you look at the NAEP scores now, and when, we, when I was on the board, but back in 2002 or three, I can't remember the year, uh, the first year we were involved with NAEP, uh, one concern was, well, they don't have the degree of poverty that we have in Atlanta or the degree of poverty that we have in Detroit. So the Council of Great City Schools, the very first year we were involved with NAEP, disaggregated the data. And here's what their findings back in the old days, and I imagine they're the same findings today uh, with Pete. Our white kids in Mecklenburg County outscored white kids nationally. Our black kids in Mecklenburg County outscored black kids nationally on Nate. Our free and reduced lunch kids outscored free and reduced lunch kids nationally on Nate. So when people say, you know, our kids are getting a good education, we could say they're getting the best education compared to these large urban school districts, but there's far more progress that needs to be made 
here in the Mecklenburg County school system. And so in terms of looking forward, uh, things that we need to do better is to accelerate the performance of all of our students because we're not competing with kids in North Carolina. We're competing with kids globally. So if there is some area that we need to accelerate, it's to accelerate the performance of all students. And I think some of the strategies and systems that Pete talked about and Eric and Bill are the strategies that need to be put in place. Thank you. Well, I think you can see we have uh, such a, a wealth of experience. Um, we, could, we could dwell on uh, any of the topics these gentlemen have brought up. Um, Peter, as a segue before we uh, uh, get to questions from the, the audience here, um, talk a little bit about the different neighborhoods, pockets, demographics of Charlotte um, to help us understand the comparison to Memphis, and then, and then why is a unified Charlotte-Mecklenburg system stronger in serving all of those pockets? Sure. When I became superintendent in 2006, Charlotte had 42% of its students qualifying for the free lunch program. Was it 54 this year? It's 54% this year. And when I became superintendent, there were 121,000 students. It's 141,000? So it's grown by 20,000 students, and the poverty level has gone up. So there's been this huge transition that's occurred within the community as far as the raw number of kids living in poverty. There's seven municipalities in Mecklenburg County, Charlotte being in the center. There's three cities to the north, three cities to the south, as well as the unincorporated Mecklenburg County. It's about 525 square miles as a school district, pretty large. It takes well over an hour to drive across the county. And um, the different municipalities were at times saying, we feel left out. We are being in a situation where the city of Charlotte is the dog and we're, you know, we're kind of the tail getting hit with it there. So we've worked very hard to work with the different municipalities. And individual board members view themselves as representatives for all the children in the district not just the children from the district that they're elected. And while there are six district reps and three at large, I was so proud when we were going forward this year with the budget cuts for weighted student staffing to see a representative of this one particular district that is one of the most wealthy say, I am going to vote this way, and I know that some folks in my community will say it disadvantages them comparatively, but it is in the best interest of all the children. And those are tough decisions to make. And in some ways, if we don't make those decisions to be more equitable now, we will make those decisions to support the children when they're young adults in other ways later, and we will pay for it, the old educate incarcerate line. And in making those decisions, we've reached out to the mayors of the municipalities, and we also have gone to a decentralized system with area superintendents who work incredibly hard to reach out to the various communities, hold community forums, meetings. Everything we do like that, we try to hold them in each of the different municipalities. And it's a lot more work, but it's the right thing to do. And also the other piece, our students now get access as well to a broad variety of magnet programs across the entire county, to be educated with students from across the county, to have access to resources from across the county, to have teachers who can move across the county and go to other places and share that support and those resources. And the district is better for it. We are a better place for that because now all the kids in Mecklenburg County are getting a better education. And that is a position we want to be in. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pass the, the microphone metaphorically or literally at whatever's needed um, out to you all now. Um, I'm going to ask that you identify yourself, if you would, please, for the benefit of our, of our panelists. And um, Billy, would you, like to, uh, would you like to start? Billy or, or Barbara, I'm going to give leadership some deference here. Billy Orgel, um, school board member. 
And thank you all for being here, and thanks to Barbara and Pitt for putting this together, and Barbara for including the school board in this. And I know we got good attendance from the Transition Commission and the school board, and it's wonderful. One thing that uh, struck me, I mean, it's impressive, and the, the Broad Award is uh, the most impressive, impressive, and that's something that we should all aim for, and uh, every community should aim for. But uh, as we're working through the consolidation, some of the feedback we're getting is that, uh, of course, no one likes change, and I think all of you all alluded to that. Uh, good staff, good principals was something that struck me, and I made a note, and I'm glad Barbara called on me. But it, did you ask the principals to move, or did you tell the principals to move? Because I think that's a yep. concern with sure. some of the parents at some of the very high-performing schools now. And what's going to happen down the road, we're happy. We've had three children go through this system. I know yep. you mentioned your daughter in middle school and, and progress that she's made now. But I think that concerns some people. Does a high-performing school get the same good leadership, maybe a different individual? And yeah. are the teachers moving and the principals moving under duress? Yeah, great question. The, just an introductory comment towards that. I told the board when they interviewed me, the most important thing I can do as a superintendent is being a good principal picker. Because that is the unit of change. That's where effectiveness occurs at the school site. From the superintendent, crying or others, you can't dictate that because I say from the superintendent. That's the unit of change, the principalship. And we did have, I want to make sure, present it in context, we had 170 principal changes in my time as superintendent. And of those, some were moves from school to school, and 100 of them were new individuals who came into the district. And in my time as superintendent, I never forced a principal to go to a school they didn't want to go to. Because it didn't work. And, and we worked with an economist out of Yale who talked to us about HR theory and the laws of large labor pools and can you force people to go to places where they don't want to go and the answer is their performance drops unless there's really unique circumstances such as the economy like now and other things. And we said if you're going to send them to your most challenged schools they got to want to go there. So we went and met with groups of teachers and principals and said what will it take to get you to go to our most challenged schools? And they said there are five things. The first thing is the school's got to have a great leader. Second thing is they want to go with a team. No one wants to be the one lone commando. So we started talking about what is a team. We found out it's a principal, it's an assistant principal. For us, it's an academic facilitator. And for elementaries, it's five teachers. So it's a team of eight that goes into the school. Then the third thing was even our best teachers said there are certain teachers at the school they don't want to be with if they go there. And one of them said to me, I don't want to go to the school with the toxic lunchroom. That's Mrs. So-and-so. She leaves for lunch early. She gets there. She sits at the table in the middle of the lunchroom, and she pollutes it all through lunch. Talking about how she hates being here. She's too young to retire. She's too old to go do something else. So we said to principals, you can pick any five. You can pick any five, and then they become my problem. And... I handled that piece working with HR. So five could be removed. We did uh, give them what we called freedom and flexibility. We said for three years we're not going to beat you up over your results because we said you're going to probably have to break some glass to get it where it needs to be. So one year in we're not going to say two points growth, we needed way more. No, you got three years to prove your metal. And then the fifth area, and actually came in fifth, they want more money, but they didn't want it till later. And of the time, I never had a principal turn me down on strategic staffing, not one. And part of it is because your best principals to go to, those, go to those schools, they aren't the ones who won't move. They are the ones who will move. And if you know your principals, you know who they are. And we have some principals who about every three years we have to move. We got some that just clean up a place and move. And we got others that can go to a school and maintain and do great work, but it just takes kind of knowing them and savvy. So, Yeah, there's, there's one. Pete described the surgical strike, okay? <laughs> 20, 25 schools that this strategy would work in. We got 168 schools. The, with the board setting the priority that it's about performance, not longevity or compliance, and a superintendent that had the, gut, the guts to emphasize performance, 
I remember this uh, one day that Pete described what he did with his own superintendents. He had them all come in and lay out performance evaluations. Couldn't tell what name they were or who they, what school they belonged to, but he asked them to critique those evaluations. And then he laid down some data about those same individuals' performance and asked his leaders, are we being honest with our staff about the evaluations we're giving? And just in the two years I've been on the board, I've noticed the change in culture. Yeah, it tightens everything up. It creates some stress. But it's exactly what I want as a parent. I want a teacher and a principal on their game every day in every school. And the way you do that is a superintendent that'll set the standard, but a principal that'll make it happen at every school level. So that's the broad brush effectiveness that made the system step out. As you're, as you're passing the mic down, I want you all to answer, but also maybe one of, one of you, um, Bill or Arthur, can address, I think embedded in, in Billy's question, is the concern that, that f parents and teachers in high-performing schools have around let us stay high-performing. And so how does strategic staffing reassure people that the high-performing schools can stay high-performing and not lose their talent? One of the unintended consequences, and maybe Pete intended this, but we didn't realize it at first, is those principals who were asked to leave the high-performing schools and go into some of our more challenged schools, they also were getting the gold star. They were being recognized by the superintendent as being those special leaders that would go and turn a school around. And the fact that they took a team with them, with an assistant principal and five teachers and a facilitator, it made all the difference in the world because it changed the culture. Now, the people who were upset at first were those parents at some of those schools. Why are you taking my great principal? But I can tell you there are a lot of very good young leaders that are out there that need to have an opportunity to grow. And I don't think there has been any drop, or if there has been a drop, it's just been minimal uh, in those schools that lost those principals. And I know there was some grumbling from some of the parents in some of those schools because I'm friends with a lot of these principals, but it has been minimal, Billy, just minimal. I did move my daughter's principal. <laughs> I just, um, I can recall, we built a school. I'm like the old story. These are the new guys on the block. But we built a school in 1985 on Highway 51. Uh, that school was populated, I think, in 87. It was finally completed. It was called Providence High School, and uh, nobody wanted to attend. Uh, we, uh, we put a guy named Greg Klimmer, if you guys know him. Uh, we took him from a middle school and stuck him out there, and uh, people just raised pure hell. They did not want to go to Providence High School. But after about a year or two, uh, these guys can attest to that. You got folks uh, using different addresses just to get into Providence High School. <laughs> it turned out to be just a, just a super experience. Uh, from a governance perspective, as a board member, we held this guy right here and all of his predecessors responsible for making sure that the right people were at the right schools at the right time. And we had to go in our pockets by going to our funding sources to make sure that the dollars were available so that our superintendent at the time when I was on the board could have the kind of leadership development resources uh, to make sure that that pipeline was always full and that those questions about who's going to be the next good superintendent, that that superintendent could make sure he makes the right decision. So as a board, you have to make those resources available to the superintendent. One last comment. That's why you grow your own. You've got to build a bench. <laughs> And we did that. But I did move our daughter's principal, and I came home one day, and my wife said, that, are you nuts? How could you move this person? And I said, trust me, the person coming in here is going to do great work. My wife doesn't even think of that former principal any longer. It took the right person, and we handpick everyone and match them to the situation. I know we have some burning questions out there, and I'm going to try to assert moderator privilege. And there's 
I want to hear from every one of you on every question, but I also want to hear from every one of you with all of your questions. So we'll see if we can answer each question with one or, one or two answers. So who would like to go, to go next? Jim. Jim Boyd on the Transition Commission. Can you describe your sub-districts, uh, the work of your uh, district superintendents, and how, how is that arranged, set up uh, in your um, overall district? How do you manage that? Yeah, it, it was seven at one point in time, and now it is five uh, due to budget reductions. They are geographic areas that we absolutely made sure did not align with the school board members' boundaries. Because we did not school board members to say, that's my area superintendent. Because we felt that that would create a structure which in invites a micromanagement or a level of engagement beyond what we wanted. However, other than the city of Charlotte, we kept each of the municipalities in one area because we wanted a relationship with the mayors and the cities and the external folks. But it was just the day-to-day -day piece of having that concern of having a board member come and camp out in one of those offices. And we just couldn't create an environment where that happened. We're incredibly lean in each of those areas. There's about uh, six staff members in each one of those areas, and they provide the support and assistance. They evaluate the principals. Um, I know that when I was there, I would spend three days a year with each of those folks visiting their school, plus my regular Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Friday schedules of visits, and just really dig in and get a feel for what's going on. And we truly viewed that as that was the training for the superintendency as well. Because what we viewed is, you go run an area, then you come and run a division, and then you're ready to run any large district in America, which, by the way, helps you recruit great area superintendents that if they view, you're the channel to get to another large district. So that's how we approach them. Barbara? Just a clarification on that. You said in the, in the seven districts, you said that you kept the municipality in a all together in a district. Except for the city of Charlotte. So we have three cities in the north, three right. cities in the south. We didn't draw any area superintendent areas to split one of those smaller municipalities because we wanted that mayor and the community to know who to go to. We felt that was important. Just, just one added piece. So for Charlotte, you know, the big gorilla in the county, there's four of us district reps that all have a piece of Charlotte and, most, and somewhat a piece of the county. So we all get to experience the challenges and benefits of the city and the challenges and benefits of the county. Um, so we're going to go Dr. Smirelli next and then Ms. Williams next and get to you, Dr. Warren. And thank you for your hospitality, Dr. Oh. Smirelli. We're glad to host. I'm John Smirelli, member of the Transition Commission, also helping to host this event tonight. Uh, um, the question I have is, is, is one where I was intrigued by your talking about differential support for individual students, and, and in fact, some some students at some schools getting X amount, and then some getting significantly larger amounts. How did you make those assessments? Were they, did they have to, you have to make those early on, or are those made later on? Because I, I'm sure many many would argue that we're all of our schools now are at their max. So how do you how do you take away and also increase at different areas? So our current approach is called weighted student staffing. It's a board policy, and essentially we. Um, weight every child in poverty 30 percent more than every child who's not in poverty. So when we allocate positions, allocate funds, um, a child of poverty counts as 1.3 and a child not in poverty counts as 1. And the benefit is a school who has large concentrations of poverty obviously gets additional funding, but even a school that does not have large concentrations but still has poverty gets a weight associated with those students of need. Now we've had some debate about the accuracy of that, of that approach um, and have, have found that regardless of what it takes to qualify for uh, free and reduced lunch, that policy contributes to the benefit of all students. 
Thank you. I'm Frida Williams, School Board Commissioner for Shelby County Schools. I understand those five strategic focus areas that you shared with us, but I'm wondering, do you have a specific theory of action from which you work? Absolutely do. And the board adopted vision, mission, core beliefs and commitments and theory of action. Then the board adopted reform governance policies to align that and then we put in place a strategic plan that was in alignment with it. Then we aligned our budget with it. And then we aligned all of the uh, uh, administrators' evaluations in align with it. And everyone has an owner that you can track. We have quarterly reports. We have uh, regular updates. My evaluation was on carrying out the board's strategic plan with specific outcomes. The last thing I did my last day at work was hand Eric my evaluation book for the year, which was five years of data in the previous year before it, that they could measure our growth over time without changing the metrics and evaluate me based on results of the strategic plan. Just, okay, Dr. Warren next, and then I think Ms., maybe Ms. Gatewood has a, okay, and George. I'm not sure, yeah, this is on. Uh, I'm Jeff Warren. I'm a, a Shelby County Commissioner. You, know, you mentioned earlier that if you told people in Charlotte uh, what a great job you were doing with your school systems, that a lot of people would not believe you. Uh, we've been working really hard with reform in Memphis City Schools, and I think I understand that. So just a, a simple question. What was your graduation rate last year in Charlotte? 70%. 70%. Oh, that's right. Because the public. 72 73.6 percent okay so uh, we were 72 from, last year or this past year so and we were 70 the year before so that two percent gain we sort of mirrored uh i think that's interesting and in that people in our community need to hear that this is a na national issue and even the best systems are at 73.6 percent and i think we're at 72.3 percent this year so uh, as we move forward, I guess my question is, how can we get our community to understand how hard this is and how important it is that we pull together to make it happen? I, I think it's important to know that uh, even though our graduation rate was almost 74% last year, five years ago it was 60%. And if you dig a little bit deeper into the numbers, we have some high schools that have 92% graduation rates. And they have, we have others that have 51. Um, the reality is, is the graduation rates are closely aligned with how students arrive to the ninth grade. Kids do not, kids drop out of school in high school, but the process for dropping out starts much, much earlier. So what you do K3, what you do four, five, six, getting kids prepared for middle school is critical. Um, so I guess the way you tell the story is to share data from other districts as well. Uh, but it's not so different uh, in Charlotte as it is at a lot of other places. But this is a major, major problem. Pete used to often say, um, would FedEx be, even though we're up to almost 75%, would FedEx be satisfied if only 75 out of 100 packages got delivered on time? Right. And I think the answer is obvious. They would not be. This is a critical challenge for our country. Um, it is not okay that 25 to 30 percent of the kids who start the ninth grade do not graduate four years later. So it's not just a Memphis district problem. It's a Charlotte problem. It's a national problem. Well, one thing that's of interest with this, if you actually take our numbers in Shelby County and you combine the graduation rate of the Shelby County school system and the Memphis City school system, I think we're closer to 83 to 85 percent graduation rate. And we think we are not doing, we obviously got to do better, but we need to pat ourselves on the back a little bit for that. Good, good. Okay, um, okay. Diane George. Thank, uh, okay. oh, Thank you so much. Uh, Diane George with the Shelby County School Board. And you had mentioned earlier in your presentation that some students receive 10,000 and some receive five. How did y'all overcome that dilemma with the taxpayers? Because you said that, you know, it upset people about how that it wasn't a fair equitable amount. Could you please give me some explanation on that, please? Thank you. I mean, I'll try to start off. Um, 
when I became chair of the school board in 1997, I thought I think we got uh, 125 million dollars in additional operating funds from our board of county commissioners. Uh, by the time I left in 2002, I think that amount had gone up to 265 million dollars. And the way that we approach that is by using data. Uh, data is extremely important, as Ronald Reagan says. Uh, trust but verify. Uh, as a board of education, we had to take our story to the community. And that's why I said having a consolidated city county school district gave us an opportunity to tell that story throughout the community. And as a result of that, uh, people were concerned about the resources and availability of resources for all of our youngsters to reach those lofty goals that we said we wanted those kids to achieve. And we're willing to put skin in the game. So, um, be honest with you, we really didn't publicize that a whole lot oh. at the beginning, honestly. But when budget cuts became so severe and we had laid off hundreds of people and it exposed that issue, we were proud to say this is the commitment we're doing. The, the part of the town I live in is the part that gets about $5,000 a kid. My daughter goes to a school with 41 students in her language arts class. It's packed. And it's the right thing to do because my child's future depends on the quality of education your child gets. It's that type of can-do spirit that Arthur talked about that in the 60s was about desegregating the schools. In 2011, it's providing the right resources where we need it for all so that we all win. Okay. Um, I think Ms. Gatewood had a question. Then we're going to go to Kenya. or Barbara, did you have a follow-up to that one? It's, it's everything. It's everything, with the exception of, obviously, federal funding that is designated. Well, that's why I was saying. If you look at federal funding and you figure out your, your per pupil expenditure, then because of, of that. So you're talking about everything. And, and One of the things that we've done, too, in the organization I work with called MECED, we developed with the UNC Charlotte, the Urban Institute, these interactive maps. And they're on our website, and anybody can go see them anytime they want. And it shows exactly how much money is spent per school. But there's another correlation. Many of our highest performing schools receive the lowest funding. Some of our schools that receive the most funding still are not there academically. So we're able to prove that we're not, this is where the need is. And so our community can see that. Okay, we're warming up now. I can feel it. <laughs> okay, Stephanie, then Kenya, then Chris, then I think Martavius. Thank you. I just have two quick, quick questions. Um, the first one is the um, government consolidated. You talked about um, the schools being consolidated. It's, it's different. No, we have a separate city and county government and six municipalities in addition to the city. Okay. Uh, and then secondly, how did you keep the community engaged throughout the entire process? Um, that, that is very concerning to us. Um, specifically as it relates to the um, equity of all students. Um, ha I'd like to learn a little bit of how you all kept the community engaged through the process. As I said earlier, uh, I was an at-large member of the school board, and so I would have to travel to all of those six small municipalities uh, as well as community organizations to engage those communities with respect to what we do. I think. Peter and uh, Eric said it earlier that's carried on from years ago. We are elected uh, in some of the districts, uh, but we represent all the students of, of Mecklenburg County. And when I would go as a board chair during my tenure, I'm not sure about uh, these last eight years, but uh, the representation of the Board of County Commissioners was quite uh, diverse and had representation from all parts of the county. And we just made our case. Uh, it's community engagement. It is not easy work. Let me just tell you that. You absolutely can get there for all kids, black, white, low income, rich, uh, great principals, but it is hard work. And the results of that hard work is bringing in industry and other families coming into your community. Uh, when I chaired the Board of Education, I'm in Manhattan talking to the people at TIA Craft. They wanted to know if what about Charlotte Mecklenburg schools? And we're going to come south, and we've never been south before. 
but we articulated to the folk in Manhattan the kind of can-do spirit that was in the community. And they were somewhat leery moving from New York to Charlotte to set up a beautiful campus out by the university. But after getting to Charlotte and getting into the public school system, they embraced that can-do spirit and really was a, was a PR firm for us as some of the parents uh, that came from New York's public schools into the Charlotte public schools to chat with other people in the community about why it's an investment. It is not, an, not just a luxury expense. It is absolute investment in your public schools. I think, Kenya, that was your question, wasn't it, Kenya? What a surprise. <laughs> Martavius. Oh, and then we'll come back to Chris. Sorry. Well, just a, a couple of questions. Um, on the community engagement, can you give us like one or two ideas other than just, you know, board members going out to the, to the different, um, you know, constituents in their district? One or two things that really worked best for you, and then maybe one that, that you were surprised was a waste of time? And then in, uh, on the second part is on parent engagement. Um, do you have measures about how many, what percent of the parents that, that you reach? And, you know, how did you develop, uh, you know, your approach toward that specific thing? Did you set up a separate division just for that? That was their only, go you know, um, charge or those kind of things? Real quickly, when I was there, we had something called listening posts. Uh, we would go out into the six districts and just listen. There wasn't a presentation. We were just there to listen. Didn't work as effectively as I'd like for it to work. But the fact that we were willing to go out and engage that community was one. The second one, what was your predecessor? What was the organization before MECED? Uh, Mecklenburg, Mecklenburg Citizen for Public Schools would survey the parents and the community. And the board would actually get that feedback and try to respond to that in some ways to address the community's concerns. We actually poll. Um, we poll parents. We poll community members. We use a political polling firm to look at. Are things going well? Aren't they going well? We track media. We track stories, the nature of the stories, positive, negative. We, we, we run it. It's a large business, and we run it as such. In every quarter, I get reports based on that, and then we work on shaping the message. But there's this tough piece between... What, what does engagement mean? Engagement doesn't mean listening. In some people's mind, engagement means doing what I say. So there's a real challenge there when you've got two separate thoughts. <laughs> but when we closed schools, one of the things we heard was we didn't listen to the public. How many sessions did we do? 22. 22. We did 22 community forums, but we didn't. Listen, some things that worked well for us, engaging the university presidents, particularly the historically black college and university presidents, engaging the, uh, the uh, clergy, uh, rabbis, priests, ministers, every, reaching out. I talk a lot at churches, synagogues, just those types of things, community organizations, men's groups, women's groups, every day it seemed like and what I viewed part of my job was I did the outward facing pieces so to do that I had to get a whiz bang COO that could make sure we were continuing to run the organization because I viewed the outward piece was my job that's part of why I'm not superintendent anymore because it gets to be so physically draining that to do the job well I sometimes question if it's physically possible so Okay, Martavius. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I just want to add something. And it's a partnership between the board and the superintendent going out engaging that community. It's not just a superintendent. It is an absolute partnership between the board and superintendent. Martavius, then Staley, then Mr. Clayton. Good evening. I'm Martavius Jones. I serve on the Unified School District as well as the Transition Committee. I have two questions. The first would you talk about your enrollment policy of the, of the district and the role that the district transportation plays in that piece? By being a countywide system, I understand that you serve rural populations, urban populations, as well as suburban popula populations. So if you would talk about that. And then my next question, uh, please describe for us the role that formal 
training played in crafting some of the reform policies, uh, developing a, a theory of action for change, and some of the things that helped Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, not only win the Bro Prize, but help set a sound foundation of moving the district forward, regardless of who the board members may be or the superintendent may be. I'll tackle the second one first. So um, I have to admit, uh, five or six years ago, our board meetings were incredibly dysfunctional. In fact, they were focused more on personalities than substantive issues. And uh, I know we're unique in that. In that fact. But uh, I credit my predecessors. They committed themselves to, um, frankly, going through the bro training and to understanding in a clearer way the governance and policy role of the board, the operational role of the superintendent, and the line between the two. And so we emphasize that is part of our everyday language, and we check ourselves on that. You know, hey, uh, Eric, you're going below the line, man. You know, back up a little bit. Or some, occasionally Pete will say, you know, it's, it's okay, yeah, let's go below the line. Or Pete, hey, you need to come up here with us, you know, talk to us about it. So that formal training um, was incredibly helpful. I, I must admit today we only have one board member who was on the board at the time we went through that training. So we're having to wrestle with how do we bring on new board members and still value that training because now that's sort of in the distant memory and we've forgotten what it was like in those days. Um, so we've got to recommit ourselves to, to that type of role. Um, I think you asked about enrollment. You mean student assignment? Yeah. Okay. So as a result of, of the uh, court decision declaring us unitary uh, in uh, 2001 or so, we went back to a assignment plan based on proximity. But we had coupled with that various magnet schools, language, international baccalaureate, performance arts, those types of things, which today serve about 25,000 of our 140-some thousand students. The rest go to neighborhood schools. And we went through a period of time of having a fairly elaborate choice program, the idea being we would give parents a choice. Well, that only works if you have open seats in schools. And frankly, it only works if you're delivering this, the effective teaching in every school. And so most recently, what the board committed to, along with this path of emphasizing performance, an effective principal leading every school, an effective teacher in every school, was instead of providing an elaborate choice approach, which is just a way of avoiding the issue, let's focus on those home schools, paramount. They're the most important schools we can focus on. They serve the most children. And let's focus on the ones that we need to raise the performance of. So that's our approach today. I, I just have one follow-up, and it's, it's going to be a loaded question. So if you had the opportunity to go, although you only have one board member who went through that training, if you had the opportunity to go through that training again, would you do it? Absolutely. I will tell you, one of the most... One of the most misconstrued terms is neighborhood school. Because you can, in your mind, your neighborhood is whatever is your sphere of influence, and it may be aspirational, not necessarily what's in your community or what's near your home. Because people describe their neighborhood by, well, I play Little League with them, and I'm in Girl Scouts with that person. So it's a very difficult Piece. But the board having gone through that training to come back to that for a second, it gave me the ability to have frank and honest discussion on fair ground. Because as a superintendent, like any other job, you don't just manage those on an org chart below you, you manage up. And when you're managing up e evenly to nine people, it can be complex unless you've got some training some dialogue, discussion, and a framework for organization that everyone understands. It was incredibly helpful for me as a superintendent. Just, just one, one follow-up real quickly, uh, just a, dis a disclaimer. Um, back in 2000 with Don McAdams, we put the BRO uh, curriculum together for school board members. So uh, I absolutely support board training. Um, and while I was on the board, uh, although there was some controversy, uh, it was a meager amount, but it was like six thousand dollars, I think. I don't know if they still have it, and I probably threw it away. But th there's six thousand dollars. Each one of you need to use that for professional development. 
get out of Charlotte and go see what the world is doing with respect to public education and come back in terms of best practices. That really helps. So I don't know, budgets are tight, money's tight, but professional development of board members is absolutely critical. Can you talk about in the uh, in the handout? There was a paragraph about for both low performing schools and high performing schools. You had an exchange of autonomy for accountability. Can you talk about that and how that worked? You got to earn it, and with that, the better you, the results you have, the more autonomy you get. And we do not base it on proficiency rates; we base it on growth. Because what we found was we had some schools that had 95% proficiency, but year over year the kids were not learning or performing to the level that they needed to perform at. Yet they were given all this autonomy because all th their kids were proficient so we can do other things. Then we look we say, well, wait a minute. The kids entered the fifth grade reading at the seventh grade level. They ended the fifth grade reading at the seventh grade level. What bang for the buck did they get in the course of that year? So we started measuring everything based on growth. And in doing that, then we tied freedom and flexibility to that. And the more that the, when you reach that bar, then you got more freedom and flexibility, everything, how you used your budget. We went from a list that was four pages long of non-negotiables to three items. You will follow the law. You will teach the state adopted curriculum and you will use the reading series we use because kids move across the district. So we need that those are the only three things you had to do if you were given freedom and flexibility in the entire district. And as long as you got results, you go for it. Now, shocking when parents at some schools that had 95% proficiency found that their school didn't have freedom and flexibility to do some of the other things. But it was a real wake-up call to some parents. Wow, it feels good here, but are my kids really learning all they should? Just, uh, and Peter's my best friend. I love him to death. I have a little different take when I was on the board um, because I said I worked for five different superintendents. Uh, every one of those superintendents had growth. And so I said at some point when, when Eric Smith came on board, I love growth. But if you attach it to NAEP and AP and IB, I'm okay. So wherever you attach your goals, make sure it's rigorous instructional standards. And I think Tennessee is involved with race to the top. I'm not sure if you've already adopted your common core standards. But once those standards are fully implemented, uh, then certainly some, some movement towards uh, those standards would be, would be great. Mr. Clayton. Joseph Clayton, and I'm on the Shelby County Board of Education. I think I'm probably the senior member of this group as far as being in education 57 years. So I've seen it from uh, beginning to end. And uh, I certainly agree with many of the uh, comments that you have made. One of the things that uh, was stated uh, was the fact that the principal uh, will make or break the school. And I firmly believe that. But the fear that uh, is out there, particularly out in the uh, current Shelby County school system is just what you mentioned, and that is that when this is all over and the dust settles, that the principal and the lead teachers and the assistant principal would be moved from my school to maybe an inner city school or another school. So that is uh, one of the uh, fears, and I, my question would be, uh, you know, how do we overcome that? if that is uh, something that we would, would need to do. The other part of my concern is uh, did you have to deal with uh, municipalities having the ability to form their own special school districts during the time that you were going through the merger? And the other part of that would be charter schools, vouchers, all of these things that we are now dealing with, even though we can see the the end of what we want, but then once you get to what you want, then you got all these other things that could eliminate and uh, create a problem for the school system that this group will put together. So 
Give us some advice on how do we deal with that and have you had the experience in well, that line? Sir, to your first point, uh, how do you deal with this fear of losing a really great principal or, or teacher? Um, part of it is winners want to be on winning teams. And winning teams play the toughest opponents. And so it became a point of pride in our town to not only send our most effective principals to the most challenged schools, but now we're going to grow another one in our school. So if we're one of those schools that's not most challenged, how do we keep developing our talent? And it turns it from a negative into a positive. And it's just, it's just part of that effort of saying we're in this together. Um, what was the, the second part of your... Municipalities, yes. So, uh, um, well, what was, what was it again? My question was. Oh, form those schools. No, in North Carolina, it's the other way around. We've been moving from 175 school districts down to 115 out of a, in a state that has 100 counties, and we're continuing to consolidate into fewer school districts. Now, there was an effort at one time to divide our school district into multiple districts. Uh, not only did the legislature stand in the way, but even more effective was the economic reality. What drives our tax base in our county is the downtown Charlotte area. The outlying suburban areas can't generate enough tax to cover the basic services. They rely on our downtown area to generate the tax to fund the entire system. Well, can I get some feedback on Oh, sure. I'm the, yes. Are you dealing at all with charter schools? We, we are. The charter cap was recently lifted in North Carolina. And um, I am a fan of charter schools, private schools, home school, just people for us to compete with and go steal ideas from um, and options for parents. So uh, I, I viewed it differently than some others. I think we made a huge mistake when the North Carolina school boards and others said, we're going to draw a line in the sand and say no to charters. So instead it went from manageable growth to now the cap is completely gone and it can be as many as possible. And had an opportunity, but refusal to sit at the table, move the pendulum from here to here. So it is now alive and well in Charlotte and will be coming. And what was it, 20 something got approved just most recently? And it'll, it'll be a glut. I think it'll be hundreds coming over the next little while. Our, uh, our, our magnet schools have been our best strategy towards charters. And in addition, um, what we've added in our legislative agenda is whatever, to what extent the freedom that charter schools have benefits students, we want that same benefit for public school students. It's good enough for a charter school student. It's good enough for a public school student. Yeah, we didn't run, we didn't have charters in 90. Two, I don't think they came a little bit later on, but we had private schools. And if you read the Charlotte Observer, the newspaper there back in 92, 93, we as a board said we wanted to go back and get that population out, and out of private school back into the public school. We wanted to compete. That's why we introduced IB and all the other programs so that we can be as good as any other educational services system in that county. So we publicly said as a board of education, we want to compete. And Mr. Superintendent, how do we go out there and grab kids back out of the private school system into the public schools and set out a course of action to do such? Okay, we're going to go to Kevin Woods and then uh, Richard or Barbara, or Richard and then Barbara. Kevin Woods, school board, Shepherd County School Board. Uh, my question was, uh, was not based on that, so if anybody want to stay on this particular subject, I will waive my question to later because it was uh, my question was related to uh, engaging parents and wanted to talk about that uh, parent university and the initiation of that particular program. Um, how you how did you implement it? The benefits of that program, and if you guys would choose to stay on this particular topic right now because it is interesting, uh, you can answer that question later. Uh, I'm Thank happy you. to go parent university. It's pretty near and dear to my heart. My uh, my wife worked for a year pro bono for the school district and set it up. And uh, we don't use district dollars. We use volunteers from the community that teach all of the courses and everything. You go on the district website, you can see a list of the courses and programs that are offered. Let me give you an example of something that Parent University did. 
we found that we looked at the data for our parent-teacher conferences. All of our schools with large Hispanic populations had a much lower attendance level at parent-teacher conferences. And one thing we found out was, well, there was a barrier. A, the communication barrier, and B, many of individuals came from communities where you never went to school to question the school on what was going on in their child's life. So we did a whole series of workshops at a particular group of schools with a high percentage of Hispanic students on preparing for the parent-teacher conference where every parent left with five questions to ask to find out about their child's education. And we saw a skyrocketing in attendance. There's things like that. What do the state tests actually mean? And what does your child's data mean? Where they could bring that report they got back in and we'd explain that to them. Things like uh, healthy living, diabetes, asthma, the hospitals partnered with us, mental health partnered with us, juvenile justice, signs that my child may be engaging in gang activity. So a whole series of courses and things that is run now and uh, it is grant funded and uh, geez, over a million dollars has come in over time from our local philanthropic organizations to fund that program. And my wife quit doing that after the first year and got back to her own business, thank goodness. So. I'm Richard Holden, a member of the Transition Commission. Um, I applaud you for your outstanding use of data on almost everything you do, decision making based on data. Um, I like your school board structure, nine members but three at large, uh, six districts but three at large. I like the at large portion of that. That's, that's a personal thing. I, I think it works better for uh, decision making. So did, uh, is, was there data used to arrive uh, this particular type of, of school, uh, school board structure and uh, do you believe it's the best or do you think there's a better one out there? I guess that would be me. Um, I started off in 1985 and prior to that the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education had nine members and they all were elected at large. It was staggered terms four elected during one period, electoral period, and five the other. Uh, because our city government moved to districts in 1977, there was continuing discussion about representation on the bodies that had at-large representation, both was the Board of County Commissioners and the Board of Education. Uh, on some occasions, you would end up with uh, six of the seven county commissioners living in the same zone, on the Board of Education, you would end up with most of the school board members living in the same area. And so in terms of having some sense of, of skin in the game uh, by those who were making decisions, uh, both the Board of Education and the Board of County Commissioners decided uh, jointly with state legislation uh, to move to a, a hybrid, three members at large because of the significance of people uh, representing all of the county and then the districts to give people a sense of a district representative. But for the school board, it was a little different than the county and the city because we don't do street lights. And we can't say, as Peter said earlier, this is my school and my principal. Uh, we incorporated a little saying back in 1995 when we first went to districts is, although you may be elected by residents and constituents in your district, but you're elected to represent all the children of Mecklenburg County. So how is it working today? Um, we, we do an incredible job of representing the community. And we're accused of being a very divided board because we represent a very divided community. And now, again, not surprisingly, it all depends on the quality of the people that are elected, whether they have that view of the system as a whole and whether they're willing to take stands that sometimes are in opposition to the very people who elected them for the sake of the entire district. That number nine, is, is that a state law thing in North Carolina? No. No. We, we just developed it. It was just developed uh, in negotiations. My first superintendency, I was a superintendent in Southern California. I had five at-large board members. Three of them lived on the same street. Bad way to do things. Wow. <laughs> you got to have some structure. Thank you, Barbara. I, I don't know if um, it, we've talked about this before, but as you see, we have a transition team here that was appointed by various entities, 
each school district, uh, school board, uh, the Shelby County Mayor. We had three that were appointed by the state, and then we have the mayor and, the, and representatives from both boards. And our, plan, our um, charge is to bring a plan to the state and to the school board members that you see around uh, for approval. So being pragmatic at this time, I'd like for each of you to think about, or one of you or whatever, what, what is the best advice that you can give us? Again, we are just now merging the school districts, which is our city di district, and our surrounding and our county districts, which are a county district, which involves um, municipalities, and we uh, we want to be able to merge both of those in a way that is effective for all children. So, uh, keeping that in mind, uh, what what would be the advice that you would give our transition team? And maybe Peter, this may be a little bit of a different question, but. What would be the most important thing as a superintendent that you would want to see in that plan uh, to successfully merge these districts? And to successfully merge them is to have um, a plan that would serve all of the children in these very in, in the two very districts with their uh, different um, constituencies, different children. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, first thing I would say is simple can be elegant. Don't design a camel. Make something that people can understand, that, that is simple, that is not overly complex. And then the second piece that I would really look, leadership matters. Um, I happen to know one of the two superintendents involved with this. Uh, we had a fellowship together and back when I was a superintendent. Leadership matters. You've got to pick who's going to be the leader and get them going. That's not, I'm not pushing one way, I'm just saying leadership matters. You gotta pick whether it's one of them or someone else. You, you gotta make the pick and you gotta get moving with it and get them engaged and get them involved. Because if you want them to feel some ownership and understand it, the last thing you wanna be doing is explain, well let me tell you why we did this. Get, get them engaged, get them involved. Um, two thoughts. Um, no doubt, I mean, you're, you're a smart group and you'll handle all the operational and technical issues. As much time as you spend on all those things, I would encourage you to spend as much or more on the public perception issues. That will overwhelm any part of logic or good planning or strategy or facts or data you have. That's been my experience the past two years. And second, as a um, in my other job, in the financial services industry, I've had the benefit of being part of many bank mergers, most of them on the buying side, the last one on the being bought side. It's much better to buy than to be bought, by the way. Um, what makes those things work is culture. And what makes culture work is when we rise above the current situations and the current problems we face to point at the potential we could become together. In every one of the bank mergers I participated in, the resulting culture was not like either one of the two that came together. It was better. And it was better because our leaders said, this is what we're going to be. And we reminded ourselves of where we were, but we kept our eyes on where we were going. I just want to remind all of you that I went through this before, a few years back in my career, and so my advice to you would be to really think about the big picture, think about what can be, think about where you want this district to be in five years, in ten years, and as hard as it might be sometimes, try to avoid territorial behavior, and you know, well this is the way we used to do it, you, you need to try to get away from that. Think in terms of delivering, excuse me, developing human capital. You're thinking you want to make sure that down the road 100% of the students from Shelby County and Memphis City will graduate from high school. You have a decent graduation rate now, but it needs to get better. Um, as Eric talked about a culture, uh, think in terms of a culture that they're all of our kids. 
They're not just those kids over here, or those kids over there. They're all of our kids. Eric talked about leadership. Um, remember what I said to you about uh, Charlotte City school system in the county? The leadership in the community decided that we wanted a better learning opportunity for our kids in that county. That was community leadership. Make sure that the community is engaged in this prop proposition. The second involves uh, having a clear but shared vision of where you want your kids to be in this community as relates to education. And then finally, don't let the tail wag the dog. Don't look for the silver bullet. Uh, I go from coast to coast with public schools on a regular basis. That's my job now. Look, as Bill said, at the big picture in terms of where you want your kids to be and, your, and families to be, and collectively have that leadership to work towards that evolving door. Okay, thanks. I promised Reginald a quick question, and then I think I'm going to need to wrap it up. And if you have any other questions, I know our panelists are willing to, are willing to stay. Reginald? No pressure. Uh, Reginald Porter, Shelby County School Board. I have a lot of notes here, but I'll pick just two questions if you don't mind. One is we talked about parental involvement, engagement, community engagement, um, the principal being ahead. At what point did you engage the teachers? How much of a voice did they have? And if they had a voice, did they have a voice directly with the board as well? Uh, the other thing is, let me look on here, policies. At what point would you recommend that we begin looking at the two policies and begin to merge those? Um, is it something that we do early in the game, late in the game, and who should be the players that do that? Yeah, a yeah, um, couple pieces. First piece is I didn't do nearly as good of a job engaging the teachers in my last year as I did in my earlier years with that. Um, one of the pieces I did is I cre uh, created these environments for discussions where I'd go out to schools and talk to, talk to a group of teachers informally. But one that was really helpful was just a teacher's advisory council that I met with regularly and had discussion with. And I also met with our teacher association leadership. But what I sometimes found was I just got filtered water. Until you just go out and talk with people until you listen to them and find out what's really going on. Listen to them in the grocery store or just wherever you are and someone comes. I never, I never turned a teacher away from talking to me wherever I was if they came up to me. And it could really impact your life. But just talk to anyone. How's it going? What's it like? How's morale at the school? And I always ask questions like that because what I found was Sometimes formally structured groups deliver a particular message or deliver an agenda. You got to find ways to reach out to folks, and there's no better way to do that than doing the one on ones, getting out there. And I did, when I first came on, what I called a listening and learning tour. Man, that was popular. And in the last year, we started our teacher effectiveness work. I really felt a divide that came between me and the teachers. And I didn't manage to bridge that divide well enough. I, I wish I had done a better job with that piece. That, that's my biggest regret in my last year. Um, as far as merging the policy piece? Um, I, I don't know of a reason why to wait to, to do that work except this. Before um, policies are merged, I would really encourage a really thorough discussion by the governing board of What's our vision? What's our mission? Our core beliefs? What theory of action are we committed to? And then, you're, uh, then I would feel ready to look at varying policies and say, which one's better? How do we align the two? And then move forward. That's my only word of caution. I, I would agree. Uh, you, you made a comment about the teachers being a former principal. At the end of the day, when the bell rings, it's between the teachers and the students. Listen to your teachers. Ask your teachers questions. Provide the environment where they can speak freely, tell you what's really on their mind. And I encourage you board members, transition and county board members and city board members, go out and talk to the teachers. Quell the rumors because the rumors sometimes take on a life of their own. And a lot of times what people don't understand, they don't like. So and I'm sure all of you have very busy jobs and don't have time to do that, but I strongly encourage you to get out there 
and listen to your teachers. Real quickly, policies are like laws. Uh, they dictate behavior. So figure out what you want to do before you start developing your policies. I'm uh, going to pass on the microphone now to Barbara Prescott in just a minute for some logistics, and then Mayor Luttrell is going to wrap us up. And as I'm passing the microphone on to Barbara, I just want to thank um, our panel. Thank you all for the opportunity to do this. Um, I'm so excited about the can-do attitude I hear from Charlotte Mecklenburg, and mainly because I know in Memphis, Tennessee, and Shelby County, we have that same kind of can-do attitude and the kind of team assembled here that's going to make it happen. So I'm very, very excited, and thank you. And Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I don't want anybody to leave until Mayor Luttrell has spoken because one of the things that you mentioned earlier is about getting leadership on board, and we are very, very uh, fortunate to have our Shelby County Mayor on our team and really um, being a statesman through all of this and just downright working hard too. He's working, he was at a committee meeting before we came, so he's going to have some closing remarks. I do want to thank you, Barbara, for moderating this panel. I want to thank all you gentlemen. I know you'll be uh, thanked before I was, I'm, I sat here for a minute and saying, where are the women? But I guess it was Barbara down there that was, that was the woman. I want to remind all of uh, the, the um, commission that we will have our session together, our first session with our uh, consultant, and we'll be talking about some things uh, in terms of the big picture and some vision. But we know very well that this is an interesting arrangement here where we as a transition team are creating a plan that will go to the board. And some of the things that you mentioned are certainly the boards uh, in, within the board's authority to do. So we've got to think about and work on how we uh, work together so that all of us are, uh, so that what we produce that follows the guidelines that we've been given uh, will be something that will be useful and, and what the board will need to get into the policy issues. 4.30 at the code enforcement. Uh, we will feed you this time. Richard Holden asked me what we're going to eat, but I told him I hadn't decided what I was going to fix yet. So, <laughs> so, so we don't know, but we'll have, uh, we'll have um, dinner there, and this will be the first um, extended meeting. It'll be 4.30 to around 8.30. Uh, we'll have our full team of consultants with us, and I think we've been given a lot of good food for thought uh, today and hope that we can just continue, those of you who are on the elected board, uh, to speak with us and we with you, uh, and uh, soon we will be getting really down to the, uh, as they say, the brass tacks of this. So I'd like to turn this over to Mayor Mark Luttrell. Uh, to close us and um, and really take this opportunity to thank you to Mayor Lotterell has we've had a lot of good participation from our uh, philanthropists and our business community, uh, but the mayor has provided uh, for us staff support, um, a line in the county budget, and uh, it's been um, very very important to us. So, well, thank you, Barbara, and certainly uh, uh, there are so many people that need to be recognized for tonight. But let me start with uh, President John Smorelli, Christian Brothers. John, thank you so much. <clears throat> and I'd like to claim him as one of my appointees. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly to uh, Barbara. Great job. Great job. And you're more than just a token woman. You're a powerful woman. Thank you. <laughs> but for, for Barbara Hyde, for her facilitation of this, and certainly the Hyde Foundation for their support, let's, let's give the Hydes a, a great hand of applause. <laughs> Peter, in, prior to the meeting, I was chatting with Peter, and he says, you know, it was time for me to take a break from being superintendent. You've worn me out just listening to you. So I, <laughs> but thank you so much for your insights and, and the way that you have really presented to us uh, the challenges that you all were facing. And to the rest of you from Charlotte Mecklenburg, you have a beautiful city to begin with, and uh, you all will be complimented and congratulated for what you were able to do uh, with Charlotte Mecklenburg. Uh, as I was listening to the presentations, just some notes that uh, I made. Uh, vision. I love the comment on vision. Uh, a school district, vision a school district that you want and build it. 
Uh, it starts with the vision, certainly very important. Uh, infrastructure, I wrote the word infrastructure because we spent a great deal of time tonight talking about teacher development, principal development, uh, bench strength, strong bench, training. Those are all really just very core infrastructure type issues. And certainly we know that uh, if we're going to build for the future, we've got to start with a very solid foundation. So infrastructure, very, very important. I was really pleased with the, the level of discussion regarding community engagement. And uh, Jim Boyd, I think that's your committee, isn't it, in the transition planning. Uh, probably not a bigger job out here than community engagement. And the fact that we have so many people from the community here uh, is certainly tribute to community engagement. So for those of you uh, just interested citizens for coming out tonight and showing interest in this, uh, thank you so much for your engagement. For the media that's here, we certainly thank you all for uh, being a part of this as well. I think community engagement is indeed going to be the challenge that faces us. And when we talk about engagement, we're talking about more than just uh, our, uh, our parents and our students, but we're talking about the faith community, the education community, the business community. You know, I've said oftentimes as it relates to economic development that if we're going to grow our community economically, then we're going to chef, have to show to the world that we have a strong education system. And that's a great part of, of uh, community engagement is uh, making sure that our message is out there. Uh, leadership matters, and uh, I think we all recognize that. We have such a huge role to play in, in assuming leadership roles, and when I look at the board members from the school board and the transition planning committee, we were all chosen because of our leadership skills, and I would suggest that each of us uh, in our own sphere of influence uh, look how we can really exert our leadership during this very critical time. Uh, there are different philosophies, there are different approaches to how we resolve these issues, but every one of us are leaders, and I think we need to certainly assume our leadership responsibilities and work certainly within our sphere of influence to, to make a difference in that regard. Uh, you know, we have been at our work for, when did we start, Barbara, in August, September? And uh, we started, and I'm speaking for the transition committee and to some extent for the school board as well, uh, we started as a group of interested citizens with very little background, very little knowledge, very little information. We spent a tremendous amount of time over the last three months just trying to build our knowledge base and our foundation for the work that lies ahead. We have much to do, and we realize that we have much to do, and we realize that we have a short period of time to do it. But for those of you who maybe you're not directly engaged, uh, rest assured that you have some very dedicated citizens that are involved in this process. Uh, we're engaged in many committees. How many committees do we have now, Barb? Seven committees that have been meeting on a weekly basis for at least about the last three or four weeks. Uh, we now have a consulting group that's going to help shepherd us through this process by being our resource for those things that uh, we don't know. We have great staff that are assisting in so many ways. We have tremendous talent on this transition planning committee. Uh, we've been doing a lot of spade work and a lot of infrastructure work uh, for our committee. Much has been done, much is left to be done. So take, uh, take solace in the fact that we're working hard, certainly have confidence in the, uh, the talent that's working through these, this very difficult situation. <laughs> Uh, in the handout that we received about Charlotte Mecklenburg, it talked about 50 years in the process. Uh, we know that in the fall of 2013, we've got to have a product in place and moving forward. But that's where the transition really, really begins because it's going to take all of us working beyond 2013 to really perfect it, to work out the details that are required to make this a great school system. Uh, I still view this as the glass is uh, more than half full. We have the talent. We have the dedication behind it. Uh, we're going to get started, and once uh, uh, fall 2013 gets here, uh, we'll continue to improve as we move forward. For those of you with the school board, thank you all for being here tonight. I think any time that the two committees can get together and share that it's good. Uh, Billy Orgel, thank you for your leadership at the school board. And to my chairman, Barbara Preston,